Welcome back to KOAN Hot Talk, 1080 AM, 95.1 FM, The Joe Miller Show. We're honored to have with us Star Parker. She's the founder and president of Center for Urban Renewal and Education, CURE, website urbancure.org. I've interacted with Star a number of times. I've gone to Washington, D.C. We'll talk about somebody that has firsthand experience. She, of course, started out, grew up in the welfare dependency state, and she brought herself up and out of that. Uh, she is now, like I said, the president of CURE. She also has a bachelor's degree in marketing, international business from Woodbury University. She's received numerous awards and commendations for her work on public policy issues. She also regularly consults with both federal and state legislators on market-based strategies to fight poverty, given her firsthand experience. She's one of the names on the short list mentioned when anyone speaks of national black conservative leaders. Star Parker, culture warrior, obviously strong conservative voice in Washington, D.C. Thank you for being with us on The Joe Miller Show. I'm so glad to be with you, Joe. And, wow, I'm so glad that you're still fighting for freedom. And that I want you here in Washington, D.C., but it's good to, to be on your show and to know that you're still in the public square fighting for freedom. Well, thank you for what you're doing. I mean, you're always on the forefront on many of these issues. And, of course, recently last night with what's going on in Baltimore, I'm sure that you have some perspectives as to why something like that could happen in America. Is it because of poverty that the explosion of violence occurred in Baltimore yesterday? Well, we could say yes and no. It's because of poverty in that we have uh, centralized poverty in the country. We declared a war on poverty 50 years ago that collapsed family life because we declared a war on poverty during the same time that we were declaring a war on marriage through the feminist movement and declaring a war on religion uh, through scrubbing our schools of God, taking the Bible from the school. So, yeah, there's an entitlement culture, and people will then take advantage of opportunities like the one that the mayor of Baltimore gave them yesterday. The mayor of Baltimore, knowing the pattern, uh, those that are uh, basically being raised in these single-headed households that are full of energy and, and anger, uh, what she should have done the first day was say, look, we will get to the bottom of this death. We know that something has gone wrong when you have a severed fine at the hands of the police. We'll get to the bottom of it. But you go home. I'm declaring uh, curfew now. She should not have encouraged protests. She should not have encouraged people to vent their anger in the streets and have the police kind of just back off. So uh, it's unfortunate. Um, Now they're calling for that kind of rest. They're going into their second day of curfew. And when the dust settles, we probably, again, will not have a discussion about the welfare state, about the war on poverty, because the mayor of Baltimore is complicit. She's a liberal. Just absolutely amazing that she would say, look, the way that we're going to deal with this is we're going to give them space so they can continue to tear down stuff and that that will help alleviate the pressure. And then she scratches her head and says, huh, I wonder why my city is burning. It just seems like a completely world upside down. Right. And this is the same mayor that just a few weeks ago was on Meet the Press after the Ferguson's incident bragging about how wonderful uh, their police force is and how diverse it is and how Uh, They were able to get body uh, cameras, and she was making the case for federal uh, investment in body cameras. But when we move on to discussions about housing vouchers and school choice vouchers, all of a sudden it breaks down when you're talking to liberals who have declared this war on poverty and like the end result. Because the end result always seems that they just want more money. They want to blame somebody else to bring in more money. And I think that um, this time we should say no. You actually created this, so why don't you find the money in your own city? It's very, very unfortunate because Baltimore has, had revitalized itself. It is a, it's a good city. Uh, the people are good people, uh, and they were able to build themselves to where they were making major investments now in their harder-hit communities. But every time uh, somebody doesn't get their way, they go and destroy these communities. It's very hard to then attract more investment. Uh, I'm looking forward to the day that we have that discussion that uh, about the trends that uh, underline all of these types of incidents, and that is, frankly, the welfare state, paying people to be irresponsible with their sexual behaviors so that we have disproportionate numbers of single households raising children as opposed to marital households raising children. Because, Joe, I can guarantee you, when the dust settles, we're going to find out that not many young boys were out there who had dads in their homes. We're going to find the same thing we found when I first hit the political scene after the 1992 Los Angeles riots. When the dust settled, we found out that the majority of the rioters were from single-headed households. 
young boys with all of this energy and no dad to say, no, you will be home tonight doing your homework. Yeah, and those that were out of school, of course, probably most of them didn't have jobs, again, in part created by this d- dependency state that we have. There, There's a high correlation, though, between Where they get dual-headed a job? These are the same people yeah. that want to increase the minimum wage. They took the first yeah. rung. Yeah. Where, where's the job for the for this community of people? Their first rung is gone. Right. Yep. These guys, you see, and they can't have it both ways. You can't keep insisting on jobs when you're the one who keeps taking the jobs from your community because you keep raising the skill set standards. Yeah, no doubt about it. And also, no, no, that's quite all right. It, what, what I was going to point out is that there's also a high correlation between income and families that have a mom and a dad. And so, especially when you have, and I, I watched this video, I don't know whether you saw it or not, black mom out on the streets of Baltimore, caught her kid out <laughs> apparently riding. He had a, he had a black <laughs> hat on, you know, covering his face. And she just started beating on him. <laughs> right, right, right. And, right. you know, what, 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 and, you know, and it's gone viral, and, you know, and, and, and the frustration we can all feel, and there's a whole lot of that slapping going on because it's very difficult for a young woman to raise a boy. And what we have to do if we really want to fix this, the president can get on TV all day long and say, you know, okay, you police officers, you've got to calm it down. You've got to go and do some more relationship building on and on here and that. But at the end of the day, what we need is now more uh, money to invest in uh, child care and invest in um, pre-K. No, what we need to do is dismantle the welfare state. We need housing vouchers so that we can bust up poverty. It should not be concentrated. People that are in the, in the welfare state that have uh, that are a part of HUD and section they should be able to go live anywhere they want to so they become invisible and their kids start adopting the values of the communities they live in. These communities are overwhelmed with this with these problems because we've concentrated poverty to the welfare state. They need housing vouchers. They need to go to schools where men have collars on and and, and, and sticks in their hand and Bibles in their hand so that they get a moral framework to understand that when you get out of school, you don't go lose someone. That's what's breaking down, is that we as a society are not uh, dismantling that war on poverty that has created so much damage in these part of the communities. Well, something else we need to do is encourage families, encourage moms and dads, and it seems like society is going the opposite direction with that, obviously not just through government incentives that tear apart the family, but also with respect to what's happening on the gay marriage front. Now, you're in Washington, D.C. We just have a couple of minutes until the break, but you've been hearing the chatter about today's oral arguments. You want to give us kind of your thoughts on what's going to happen with respect to the Supreme Court on this? Well, I'm a little encouraged because they they have a constitutional uh, problem. And even Kennedy expressed that it's very difficult to see nine uh, men or, and women on a court uh, overrule the values of the state. You know, this is a, a democracy. We, we have uh, rules of laws and boundaries because states do have rights and the voters in those states. Uh, but, you know, most attention right now is on the rioting down in Baltimore. And so very little camera was showing uh, the out-of-control two-year-olds here in Washington that are um, discouraged that they can't marry uh, of the same sex. This, what is happening in society right now with homosexual marriage will destroy the institution of marriage, what little is left, as you're pointing out. So, yeah, are we going to start seeing more chaos? Yes, we will, uh, because when you redefine institutions, people's behaviors follow. That's how we got this problem with the welfare state. We started paying people to be sexually responsible and have children outside of marriage, so we got more of that. You destroy marriage, you've destroyed a core institution on how we transfer our values so you've changed America forever. I'm encouraged by the court because both Roberts and uh, Kennedy sent some signals that perhaps this is a little more complicated than just letting a bunch of two-year-olds have their way. Well, that's some good news. I appreciate hearing that, Star Parker. We're going to keep you on for the next segment, talk about your book, Blind Conceit. Blows me away, the United States, one of 17 nations permitting gay marriage. The world's against it. Let's see what happens with the Supreme Court. We'll talk more with Star Parker after these messages. Stay with us, The Joe Miller Show. Welcome back to KOAN Hot Talk, 1080 AM, 95.1 FM, The Joe Miller Show. We have Star Parker with us. She is one of the names on the short list for national speakers, black conservative leaders, founder and president of Center for Urban Renewal and Education. It's a public policy think tank that promotes market-based solutions to fight poverty. Her website, urbancure.org. 
Uh, she has seven years of firsthand experience in the grip of welfare dependency, brought herself out of that. She knows what she's talking about when she talks about the issues, the politics of race and poverty. Also very much engaged in matters important to family in this country. Star, I appreciate you staying with us. We were talking about the gay marriage decision, and we'll continue with that, and then maybe work our way into Blind Conceit, your new book. One of my concerns, when we see what this country does, we have only 17 countries worldwide that have legalized gay marriage, and yet yeah, a lot of people in this country think it's a foregone conclusion that this is the direction the world should go. And we stand as an extreme minority vis-a-vis -vis the world with respect to this issue, and yet the elites continue to push the people in this country in that direction. That's despite the fact that most polling, most honest polling out there, still shows that a majority of Americans are against homosexual marriage. I was encouraged by your comments about what you've heard on the street in Washington, D.C., about today's oral arguments on the issue of homosexual marriage and where the court may go. What really are the implications of saying that, you know, anything goes with marriage? Is it something that will fundamentally impact the family? Will it adversely impact, especially, let's just say, the inner city? I mean, that's your area of expertise. Well, we can start in the inner city and, and then go to the impact it will have on our entire nation. Keep in mind that if the court rules that homosexual marriage is a right, and they find this right in the 14th Amendment, then as a nation, we have to change every law. We have to change everything from birth certificate to death certificate, because this is not a gender-neutral society. We are very neutral-specific, uh, I mean, gender-specific. We ask questions of male and female, boy and girl, grandparent and grand. So the challenge before us and before the court is more than just you know, social activism of two-year-olds. And the reason I keep calling them two-year-olds is because my, when my granddaughter was two years old, I would like, buy the whole Toys R Us. But then we get to the counter to pay for everything, and she saw one more little 50-cent thing that she wanted. I say no, and she explodes. Uh, and that's what's happening with the gay activists now, the LGBTs. If they don't get their way on absolutely everything, they explode and, have a, a, and, we'll, and we'll send this nation in social chaos. One point on the impact on the urban community. We already know that 68% of black children are now being developed in single-headed households. They live there. 17% of 17-year-old boys have a dad at home. This is a tragedy. But what we also have are 500,000 orphans. A lot of people don't think about the foster system, which is now availed if homosexual uh, marriage becomes the law of the land to these homosexuals. Right now, the qualifiers of our nation's most vulnerable children are very rigid. There is no way. In fact, it's just a few recent years that even a single person could foster a child because we were consistent in building a healthy uh, civil society, knowing that a child needs a mom and a dad, and we knew of the contributions they bring to the table. So, yeah, when you talk about homosexuality and homosexual marriage becoming the law of the land, HUD has to change its policy. Labor has to change its policy. HHS has everything written on all law. Even our real estate laws are, are not gender neutral. They're written gender specific. We talk about male, female. We talk about our death certificates. So, so that just to give you a picture into the legal chaos that we will go into uh, with homosexual marriage law. But that said, the question before the court is not one of sexual orientation. It's does a state have the right, do the voters of the state have a right to say, we want to define marriage between a man and a woman? That's the question before the court. And then the second question is, if, yes, the people of the state have a right to say, this is how we're defining marriage between a man and a woman, and we're going to codify in law consistency to what we've known throughout history of the American people, that a marriage is between a man and a woman, uh, if that happens, then what happens in the states where they do have gay marriage? What happens to that couple? How do you, you know, sort these 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 things through? Right. Frankly, I think we should sort them through before uh, we we do it. Uh, we don't want to have another Nancy Pelosi moment that we'll find out what's in Obamacare after you know we pass it. Um, so, and I'm, let's hope that the court is reasonable. And yes, some of the signals today, even out of Kennedy, were that they perhaps are going to be a little more reasonable in thinking about the impact of this one decision on all of our society and every aspect of our society. 
Yeah, I mean, Kennedy has, has had the reputation of being somewhat of a states' rights justice. And you know, some have thought, well, okay, he's going to split the baby and say, yeah, states do have the right to decide. I mean, him being the swing vote could determine it with a plurality decision, that states do have the right to decide. But if one state decides that gay marriage is okay, the other states have to recognize it. And, of course, that would effectively cause all states to be basically gay marriage states because, obviously, yeah. homosexuals would go to the state that would allow it, and then, of course, <laughs> their states that they reside in would be forced to recognize. Well, that's what happened. So, I mean, this is how it got here a little bit because when a couple in Massachusetts married, they immediately moved to, to Texas to get a divorce. Well, it's not legal there. Or right now, uh, Texas is having trouble because they moved Toyota out of California, which is a gay marriage state. Uh, and Toyota's top tier, some of their executives were married to each other as homosexuals. And then that means that now that they're in Texas, they're not married anymore. So it is very complicated. So that's why it needs time. What has happened uh, with these two-year-old uh, aggressives is they have pushed this country to have to make some decisions that are going to change reality throughout our 100 years into our future, perhaps. So what we need to do is slow the pace. And let's just hope that the, um, that the justices think about that. Uh, fostering is only one area that we have to think about what happens to these children. You know in the state of California already they passed a law to where even in our elementary schools, uh, those that are the Qs, they have L, G, Bs, and Ts, and Qs now. Well, the Ls and the Gs, people keep saying, well, you know, let's, I know a few of them. But what about Bs? <laughs> How are they married? How, what happens to the Bs? What happens to the Ts? And what happens to the Qs? And in California, what they said was, well, you know, if they're questioning, then they should be able to go into any bathroom they want to. So you have elementary school boys going into girls' bathrooms and showers now. So we have to see that now as the whole country uh, avail to these types of uh, questioning people. Uh, the Bs are a big complication. In fact, Ryan uh, Anderson, who wrote What? What is marriage? Um, is one of the authors on What is Marriage out of the Heritage Foundation. And anyone that wants any information on this should probably get that. Because he's already looking at uh, some of the questions that are being asked it's by the homosexuals because they have to get it all. Uh, so instead of couples, they now want ruffles. Because what do you do with bees? And instead of, and instead of wedlock, they want wed least. Well, these are not, this is not the play with. This is civil society, and this is a major institution when you talk about marriage. I wrote in my column. Uh, this week, you know, because I'm also a syndicated columnist, I reminded people that Judge uh, Robert Bork, uh, the late Judge Robert Bork, said 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, this needs to be a constitutional amendment. We have to put, we have to codify marriage in our United States Constitution. So I think that even if we get a, what some might think, those of us that are traditionalists, might get a discouraging opinion from the court, the battle's not over because we can, as you said, as you pointed out, the marital people are on our side. So we can. Uh, uh, to wage another opportunity to get this written into our United States Constitution that we know what marriage is and it doesn't need to be redefined. Yeah, very well said. With an activist judiciary, of course, all it takes is the change of one justice in order to change the entire meaning of the Constitution or the application of the Constitution. Right. So we can't right. ever let, let our guard down. But the, but Brian Anderson was on this program several weeks ago making oh, exactly that good same good point. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he's a good guy. He yeah. just, it, it's all an illogic. And when you sit back, you know, I was on Fairbanks a couple of years ago at a public school board meeting and listening to the head of the school board talk about how we need to allow these transgendered, gender identity crisis kids use the bathroom that they're most comfortable with. And, and I mean, it was just, it was surreal to listen to that. I mean, it's like, what planet am I on? Right. It's, I, it's certainly, situational ethics, yeah, and you can't govern a, a diverse society of 350 million people through situational ethics because we all want our way. So you have to have a rule right. of law. And I think that there is respect on the court. And everyone's watching Kennedy thinking he's a swing, but I'm just not so sure that son Sotomayor is going to come down as liberal as many have said because there have been other things that she's kind of a little bit looked into. Now they may whip her back to and remind her of you know, who she's supposed to be. But I'm just not sure that she's 100% sold on upsetting uh, this entire reality in our country. Because as you pointed out, most of the world knows that there's something wrong with males marrying males and females marrying females. And as I said, I don't know what we're going to do about the bees and the and the T's and the Q's. But we do know <laughs> that with the L's and the G's, um, we, this needs to be, at the end of the day, all sexual behavior is adult behavior. It should be private. For them to have brought this into the public square, of course they're going to run into parents and priests that are saying, no, this is still sin. No, I don't want you teaching my children. So what will happen if the court rules 
against traditional family life through marital couples, male, female, raising children, is that we will now have another level of the cultural war. Uh, and I think that the cultural war that we've been in, the war on marriage, the war on uh, poverty, and the war on religion, has already divided us as a country, and this will just make that more certain. No question about it. Uh, the battle lines are drawn. I mean, this is because it has such an impact on free exercise, as we saw with the decision that came out yesterday, the $135,000 judgment against the baker. I mean, those type of things where it actually infringes on some fundamental belief, the fundamental nature, the reason that we had people come to this country, you know that that's going to create a, com a real serious conflict that isn't just going to be something that over a few years is going to dissipate. And, and I think that the justices hopefully were informed by argument today of that situation that we're in as a country and that recognize that if they do decide to go the wrong direction of it, it's going to be terribly upsetting to the social yeah. fabric of the nation. And yeah. we just oh, have no, a couple of are, minutes they left. Have, I, they have witnesses. They have witnesses for children raised in these households that are basket cases. Yep. Oh, it, it, this is not as a slam dunk as, you know, many of the mainstream media or, or, or left-wing commentators would try to have us believe that, oh, it's a done deal, guys, keep, let's move on. No, it's not. And it won't even be yeah. after the court rules. Remember, the court ruled on Dred Scott, too. We've had other ill rulings in this society that were um, maybe legal but not lawful in God's eyes, and so we continue to fight. And, in fact, that's some of the things I address in my book, Blind Conceit. We have to move forward to save America. That means restoring traditional values, limited roles of government, free markets, and pulling ourselves together as a nation. So um, this, the, to allow a few, because it is a few, to dismantle and upset our entire society at a certain point the quiet have to get up and say you know this is where the line is and the line on marriage should be clear because as you've already pointed out it's we the only little bit of society that's still healthy if we disrupt that there's the there, marriage has not a marriage is already in trouble i mean did you know that the, do you know the percentage of, of american people that are husband wife children the percentage in, in 1970, the percentage of people who lived in a – children that were in a home with husband, wife, children, the, the ones that are in our country, was 48 percent. 48 percent of American culture was made up of husband, wife, children. You know what that number is today? 17%. Much lower. 17 percent. Yeah. Husband, wife, children. Yeah, unbelievable. It's well, and the single-headed household, is, it transcends race as well. I mean, the white families yes, have the same issue that's, going that's on. That's my point. Yep. Absolutely. 42% of American children now are raised in single-headed households. Now, of course, that number includes adults and other people that are living single and, and not in you know, any type of marital structure. But when the, when the majority of the people in society are just disconnected uh, individuals, you have to challenge. We don't have that family core. So you go on top of that, this scenario to where you redefine even what the institution of marriage is, then you're going to be able to look at any and every inner city and see where we're going. This is not the first time that, that we, we're desiring households where you're going to have two females in them. We see that now in every inner city with a mom and a grandmom, and it's just not working. So we need, and they both love the child, but it doesn't work. A child needs a mom and a dad. A girl needs a dad. Star Parker. A boy needs a dad. That's it. <laughs> Star, I appreciate your insights. we got to go to break. I wanted to give our audience, though, an opportunity. The new book, Blind Conceit, where can they get it? e -book. Go to their favorite e, and then it'll be out in print in about a month. So on Fantastic. E yep. I appreciate that, Star. I mean, you're very articulate, right on point. I appreciate your finger being on the pulse of what's going on, uh, particularly appropriate given on what's going on in Baltimore today the oral arguments before the Supreme Court. We'll have this interview podcasted. Hope to get it out to a broader audience. Thank you so much for being on The Joe Miller Show. Well, I appreciate being with you and look forward to you coming and being in Washington, D.C. Senator from the great state thank, <laughs> thank you, Star. I appreciate it. UrbanCure.org, Star Parker. Stay with us. We've got more after these messages.